Kaufman, uh, exploring W1 plus infinity in CCFP. Take it away. Great. Um, so thanks to the organizers for um, organizing this conference. Uh, it's already been really exciting. Um, and it reaffirms my, my theory that I should keep doing this kind of physics because it takes me to really nice places. Um, so I was told that I am in control of when everybody goes for lunch today. Um, so I will keep that in mind. Um, yeah, so I guess I, I'm going to be talking about some work that we did last year with um, Adam, uh, Jakob Salzer, and Andy. Um, it's sort of a precursor to this whole discussion that um, Akshay and Adam started this morning. Um, so while that is a very nice uh, sort of after effect of <laughs> this paper that we put out, this is a much nicer story, which I think has a little bit less controversy. So um, <laughs> we'll, we'll explore a slightly um, simpler model in this, in this talk. Um, all right, so another nice part about not being the first speaker is you've already provided a lot of the background that I needed for this talk. Um, but just to reiterate, uh, celestial holography is nice because it allows us to use what we know about 2D conformal field theories to constrain a putative theory of quantum gravity in four dimensional asymptotically flat space time. Um, and the majority of the progress thus far has been made considering interactions between gluons and gravitons in the bulk and sort of seeing what they imply for the boundary theory using symmetries that we know that they obey. Um, but it's been a nice question to have to try to find a specific duality between some kind of a bulk theory and some specific conformal field theory, which Andy mentioned to us this morning. Um, and in sort of moving celestial holography from this uh, bottom up approach to a more top down approach. Um, and you've already heard a little bit about this again from Andy and also from Akshay, but you'll also hear it a little bit from, uh, I think, Eduardo and um, Walker and probably others throughout this conference. Um, so in this particular case, what we've done is maybe could be thought of as like half of that story where we considered a specific bulk theory and tried to see um, what it implied for a celestial CFT and what we looked at here was self dual gravity. Um, so I will first review some of the results of this uh, W1 plus infinity symmetry that appears in celestial CFT, which again, you've heard a little bit about. So at this point, it might already be reviewed. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the nice properties of self dual gravity and why we chose to talk about it. Um, and then I'll, I'll describe what we did to show that this uh, W1 plus infinity algebra um, is actually unchanged at all orders in perturbation theory if you start from self dual gravity, which is sort of the main result. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, what the implications for that are and uh, some of the outlook. All right. So, yeah, since you'll hear a lot about this, I'll try to be rather brief. Um, so the story begins with this paper uh, in 2021, where they showed that you have this tower of soft operators, right? So if you say that uh, these GKs that I've written there are your insertions of um, uh, a graviton in a um, conformal correlator, if I take their, um, if I take them to integer dimensional weights, then I get this, uh, get a set of soft operators. Um, and we also saw that the OP of these operators was given by collinear limits of scattering amplitudes in the bulk space. Time. So if we put those two things together, we were able to get the OP of these soft operators. Um, and now if you start with those soft operators using this prescription of contour integrals that, that Adam was also talking about, you can get the commutator of these associated currents. It's just the usual thing that you do in, in CFT. Um, and if you take, so, so that, that formed an algebra, you got this algebra of these soft operators in celestial conformal field theory, um, but by a nice rescaling of these operators, which is given by these, these Ws here in terms of these Hs, um, which Andy wrote about in his paper, um, you could actually transform this algebra into what looks like this um, uh, wedge sub algebra of uh, W1 plus infinity. Um, and also, yeah, so um, as Akshay also mentioned, um, these, this particular transformation can also be shown to be related to this light transform. Okay, so these are all parts of the story that, that you've heard before. Um, 
So I will review the, the OP story just a little bit because it's um, sort of Im important for the calculation we did. Um, so I haven't written for you how the normal mentor parametrize is the usual thing in terms of Z and Z bar. Um, and a collinear element is when these two things, uh, the dot product goes to zero. So that either means we take Z12 to zero or Z bar 12 to zero. Um, usually we'll talk about the holomorphic uh, collinear limit. Um, and if we do that, then um, we, the, the, the procedure to obtain the OPE is we usually start with the bulk amplitude. We take this collinear limit um, and this is in momentum space. Um, and when you do that, you'll get some sort of splitting function, which I've labeled by S. Um, and then when you actually to do the Mellon transform to celestial CFT, um, you'll get, so the, the splitting function will give rise to the OPE coefficients between these two operators. Um, and I think this was also mentioned before, right? So if you look at this beta function, you'll, if you write it in terms of gamma functions, you'll realize that it has holes when uh, delta one minus one or delta two minus one is zero or a negative integer. Um, and that corresponds to this, the dimensions of these um, infinite uh, soft operators. All right, so there are a couple of questions that we could ask at this point. Uh, one is we could say, well, we found this algebra at the classical level because all of these OPEs that we wrote down were by uh, transforming tree level uh, amplitudes in the 4D theory. So does it receive quantum corrections? What happens when we try to consider loop level amplitudes? And that's what we were concerned with in, in this paper where we considered a toy model of self-dual gravity. And I'll tell you why we considered that particular model. Um, but of course, the, uh, it, it's been noted that another interesting question we can ask is, what if we have other interaction terms in this bulk theory, right? Um, so one could ask even at tree level if this algebra gets deformed somehow. And we've already talked a little bit about that story, which was explored in, uh, in these papers here, but also elsewhere clearly. Um, so I think that's a very, definitely a very interesting um, question to ask, but uh, not what I'll talk about here. So why is self-dual gravity nice? Well, there are finitely many S matrix elements. Um, and that, if, if you think about, you know, looking at a complete, theory in the bulk and defining, you know, it's complete celestial dual. If you have finitely many S matrix elements, it already makes it easier to work with, right? Because you have a lot less things that you need to transform. Um, so at the classical level, self-dual gravity is just defined by this condition on the Riemann tensor. Um, it's very similar to the self-dual condition on uh, the electromagnetic field tensor that you, you have in, uh, in gauge theory. Um, now, let's go back to also this idea of Klein space that Andy talked about briefly. Um, here, you also need to be talking about Klein space because in usual Lorentzian signature, you don't get any real solutions to this equation. Um, so it was imperative that we also, uh, we also worked in Klein space, which sort of fits into this whole story of, of talking about celestial CFT and Klein space. Um, now, there's also this question about how you get both helicity gravitons out of this. Um, if you study this equation, this equation, you can see that solutions are built out of positive helicity plane waves. Whereas if you consider the anti-self-dual case, you would get negative helicity plane waves. Um, so somehow you need to you need to figure out how you get both positive and negative helicity things. And in the literature, there are many ways you do this. Um, Rather than trying to figure out exactly the best prescription and how it works, uh, we just chose one that was used by Chalmers and Siegel. Um, and what they do is they, they uh, you have a Lagrange multiplier in their Lagrangian and that enforces the self-duality condition, but it also plays the part of the negative helicity graviton. Um, so therefore you can you end up having both positive and negative helicity guys. Okay, so what are the S matrix elements of self-dual gravity? Um, so in this prescription, the S matrix elements have one minus L negative helicity gravitons where L is the number of loops. So what that means is if you have zero loops, so at tree level, you have one negative helicity guy. And if you have one loop, then you have zero negative helicity guy. So you only have the all plus amplitudes. And once you get to higher than one loop, you have negative negative helicity things, which means that all of those amplitudes aren't there in the theory. 
Okay, so that's why the, the set of S matrix elements is really nice. And on top of that, um, the only non-trivial uh, tree level thing is the uh, three-point amplitude of the two positive helicity and one negative helicity graviton. Um, so it's already nice at tree level. Now at one loop, the answer looks a little more complicated, but at least we know exactly what this expression is for all n. Um, so these are the, uh, the n graviton one loop amplitudes that were computed by uh, B. Byrne and others in, in a paper from a while ago. Um, and it will be relevant to know that these h's that appear in the sum here are called half soft functions, and they're given by this complicated uh, combination of spinner helicity things. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that, but there are, yeah, so you can, you can play with those if you have some time. Um, so, okay, so we have these, we have these S matrix elements now. And what do we want to do? Well, we want to figure out, as I said before, what it, what, if any, are the corrections to the, uh, boundary algebra, if we consider the loop corrections to the amplitudes. Um, so. As we saw, it depends. So the the collinear limits gave you the uh, gave you the OP coefficients, and the algebra was derived by taking the OP coefficients and doing these contour integrals. So if you work backwards, you say, well, if we have corrections to the splitting functions, right, which were what gave us the OP coefficients in the first place, then those are the things that should give us corrections to the algebra in the end. Um, but in the literature, it was actually shown that the splitting function for these one loop amplitudes is actually exactly the same as at tree level. But they were taking the true collinear limit, which I guess it's sometimes called, where z12 and z bar12 are taken to zero together. Okay. But um, what, what I mentioned before is that usually we talk about the case where it's just the holomorphic collinear limit, right? So we just take z12 to zero. So in that case, what you have to do is you have to actually confirm that the splitting function is the same. Um, and so that was in large part what we did. Um, and so we defined, you know, big P as the sum of the two uh, things that we were taking collinear. Um, and then you define T, which is omega one over omega one plus omega two. And the tree level splitting function, which we already know was given by this thing, and what you do is you take those complicated half soft functions that I mentioned before, and you look at what happens in the limit where you take, you know, this combination of momenta. And after some algebra, you can show that um, this one type of half soft function has um, this limit, and this other type of half soft function has this limit. Um, the difference between these two is the fact that. Here A is anything, but here you've actually taken A to be one. Um, if you actually go in and like look at the form of these half soft functions, you'll see why that's relevant. It's a lot of combinatorics. Um, so, so then putting all of this together, you can plug it into the formula for the one loop amplitude for these n gravitons, and you can show that in fact um, you get the same tree level splitting function which therefore implies that you should get the same uh, OPE coefficients and therefore the algebra should be uh, undeformed at loop level. Um, but there was a interesting thing that we needed to do here. Um, when we were actually doing this calculation, if you take the uh, collinear limit of this uh, loop level amplitude, you get in addition to the usual um, term with the usual splitting function, you get a term that's actually proportional to of um, spinner helicity things, and which when you do the true collinear limit, that thing actually vanishes, right? Because you have z bar one two also going to zero. Um, but in our case, it doesn't. It is actually relevant. But it was proportional to this thing, which obviously, if you look at it, is zero. Um, but um, that was sarcasm. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was actually shown to be zero in this paper by Rao and Feng from 2016, where they said, you know, people are talking about uh, soft limits and uh, it would be interesting to figure out some identities that are useful for this. And they proved that this was zero. Um, very conveniently for us. Um, I, I don't know if 
anybody has yet understood exactly why this was a requirement. Um, if anybody does know, then I would be interested to know because I still don't understand. Um, but it was definitely it was definitely imperative for our discussion here because otherwise we would have had some kind of a modification. Um, so so yeah, so so the fact that this was zero is definitely an interesting thing. I think it's you know from from their point of view, it was more just sort of a mathematical proof that they did. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it would be nice to understand why it was relevant for this particular case. Okay, so let me just go through from beginning to end what I talked about here, right? So we, we started with this infinite tower of soft operators um, and soft symmetries. Um, and then we saw that if you took, well, we knew from before that if you took the OPs of these operators, um, the coefficients were found by the collinear limits of these scattering amplitudes. Um, and then it was nicely shown that you can uh, rescale them and form a W1 plus infinity algebra um, by doing these contra integrals of the OP. Um, and then what we did was consider self dual gravity, where we had, um, we, it, was, it was nice because it had a finite set of S matrix elements, right? It had one tree level amplitude, and uh, which is the plus plus minus MHV. And at loop level, there were only the all plus. Um, and which we had an explicit expression for. Um, and so we were able to uh, show that the splitting function was exactly the same in the case of the all plus amplitudes. Therefore, um, the loop corrections didn't exist and the W one plus infinity algebra was uncorrected in self-dual gravity, um, in quantum self-dual gravity. So, so I think this is a, it's a nice little story because self dual gravity is a fun little toy model to consider. Um, and, you know, it was, it was nice to sort of see that, you know, um, you, oh, for one, that the W1 plus infinity structure was, uh, was remained unchanged. Um, but as I said before, you know, this is something that has, I'm sure everybody here has already come to understand that this is something that has a very rich, uh, um, Set of things to be discovered. So uh, I look forward to seeing, you know, other ways in which um, this algebra gets deformed or changed or, or whatever. So, um, yeah, uh, that was it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot for a very clear talk. Um, David has a question. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, there are lots of things you might mean by quantum self-dual gravity. And the um, Chalmers-Siegel version is, is, of course, one of them. But it's a little bit cheap in that theory to say that it's W1 plus infinity is perturbatively exact, because there's kind of precisely one non-vanishing amplitude. And so there's one thing you have to check. And, and right. done, right? Yep. A more interesting version might be to take the same charm of Siegel Lagrangian, but to treat all the fields as, as the same field. So instead of having a separate phi bar as a Lagrange multiplier field, you just treat it as the same as, as phi. Okay. So that has the same classical equations of motion for phi. Maybe you have to adjust some numerical symmetry factors a little bit. But now there are multi loop amplitudes as well. Yeah. It differs by a factor yeah. of a half, but nothing else. So was it only a factor of a half? It's only a factor of a half. The, the okay. basic point is that. You know, instead of having phi phi bar running either way around the loop, you've only got a phi. So okay. it's just a symmetry factor of a half that's different. But the, but the amplitudes are exactly the same at, at, at one loop, but now they get higher loop corrections as well. Do okay. you know anything about what might happen to double say? No. no, it doesn't because you don't have the phi bar, right? So. It, it would yeah. just be interesting to know whether W1 plus infinity survives at higher loops in a theory that actually has some higher loops. Do you know if all of the all of these amplitudes, like the structure is completely known? I'm not sure whether any of them are known. I okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, no, that would that would definitely be interesting. Um, yeah, uh, that was obviously not something we considered, and you know, as you as you said, you know the nice part of this particular a model of quantum self dual gravity was that we had only these two types of amplitudes, so it made it made the story a lot easier. Yeah. 
Um, and, and that's exactly why, you know, it's, it's sort of a toy model of this whole, uh, this whole thing. But yeah, that would, that would definitely be interesting. I, I would like to look into it. Uh, and also further talking about the distinctions between those two theories, uh, the, 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 the one used in this talk uh, coincides with a, a sector of gravity, uh, yeah, where, whereas the other theory, I guess, disagrees with gravity, but it's still, yeah, it, it, it does sound very interesting to look at the higher loops in, in that other theory. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess cheapness is in, is in the, Better, really. <laughs> uh, sorry, 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 I was just clarifying that, that I, I think like that, that factor of two difference for the one loop amplitudes was the reason Chalmers and Siegel said like their Lagrangian is better than some ones that had previously been used in the literature. Yeah, I guess, I guess cheapness is in the eye of your beholder. Um, we, we we thought this was pretty non-trivial, and it, in fact, we we were surprised that W one plus infinity was preserved. We were expecting either nothing or or wow. one of the deformations. So it's still something of a, a, a mystery, and it, it's nice that there's this uh, a theory with so much a quantum theory with so much symmetry, um, yet that is is it's soluble. And and non-trivial, and um, I mean, it might be interesting to try to, you know, we know all the perturbative classical solutions of self-dual gravity, and since we have all the same symmetry, we could start asking questions like, what are all the quantum, what are the representations that the states fall in? I, so um, it's a curse and a blessing, I guess. Yeah, I guess to so the other reason why I brought up that extra thing that happened to be zero was because that that did for a long time make us think that we had this extra term that was going to give us some kind of a change to the algebra at loop level. So it's yeah, <laughs> it's fun that it was zero and so it was unchanged, but you know it, our expectation going in was actually that we would find some sort of a difference. I guess that the um... If you look at what Pope and friends did, um, it looks like the somehow the, the deformation from little w to big W is a deformation. It's a it's a, a quantum effect in the boundary theory, not a quantum effect in the bulk theory. And maybe that's Maybe that's what you found in your Moyle bracket sets, something being deformed in the boundary theory. And this, I guess, is a quantum effect in the bulk theory. I don't know. Yeah. Any more questions? If not, then it's time to break for lunch. Uh, before let's uh, thank uh, Shruti again. So for today you have to find for yourself